North Korea appears to be repairing the Punggye-ri nuclear test site, which it dismantled in 2018. Various reports also suggest the regime could be gearing up to test more missiles. President-elect Yoon suk yeols transition committee is taking shape. It remains to be seen if An Chol Su, who dropped out of the race to support Yoon, will lead the team. Yoon suk yeol and Japan's prime minister agreed to cooperate to improve ties. The president-elect also met with the U.S. charge of affairs in Seoul and China's ambassador in Seoul. We'll be wrapping up the week well. I'm Daniel Che here to bring the latest. Let's begin with our top story. Yoon Sung Yeol's chief of staff and spokesperson are revealed. The head of the president elect's transition committee will be announced as early as this weekend. Lee Gyeong starts us off. Two of president elect Yoon Sung Yeol's top aides were revealed on Friday. Chang Jae Won is named as Yoon's chief of staff. Kim Eun Hye is named as Yoon's spokesperson. Lawmaker Chang was a key figure in the last-minute campaign merger between Yoon and Anchors of the People's Party. Kim, also lawmaker, was the head of the Yoon campaign's public affairs team and previously served as presidential spokesperson during the Lee Myung-bak administration. On his first day as chief of staff, Chang said he's speeding up the forming of Yoon's transition team. They will include a special committee on national unity, the slogan of Yoon's administration. There will also be a task force for the committee's top agenda, COVID-19 recovery. Another task force will be in charge of relocating the presidential office. From the secluded Blue House to the Gwangamun area, just down the road but wide open to the public. The Gwangamun presidency was Yoon's first pledge on the very first day of campaigning. The office will move into the government complex along with a team of experts. We are planning that a committee on private partnership will also come along. As the president-elect had said, he will actively reflect the creativity and ideas of the private sector. As for who will lead the transition committee, Anchors of the People's Party is largely considered as a prime candidate. Anne had launched with you, but that very topic was not on the table. We didn't talk about appointments today. We discussed pending issues and the overall state affairs. But the two may have discussed the overall formation of the transition team. Exact names were not mentioned, but I'm guessing that they've largely agreed on the overall big picture. Chang said the head of the committee will be finalized over the weekend and some 20 other posts by next week. Young in Arirang News. President-elect Yoon held a phone with Japan's prime minister and showed support for future-oriented bilateral ties. He also met with China's ambassador to Seoul. Yoon Jung-min tells us more. President Oleg Yoon song yeol spoke over the phone with Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Friday, stressing the importance of bilateral ties and cooperation on North Korea issues. Kishida congratulated Yoon, and Yoon sent a comforting message for the people of Japan on the 11th anniversary of the devastating 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami that hit Japan's northeast. The president-elect stressed the importance of friendly ties and cooperation between Seoul and Tokyo for security and economic prosperity. Both Yoon and Kishida highlighted the importance of trilateral cooperation with the U.S. on Korean Peninsula affairs and agreed to meet as soon as possible. Kishida reportedly touched upon North Korea's nuclear and missile programs, including ICBMs, as well as the issue of abducted Japanese nationals. Their conversation comes as Seoul-Tokyo ties are at a low over historical issues. Kishida was the second foreign leader to have a phone conversation with Yoon following U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday. Also on Friday, President Oleg Yoon met the Chinese ambassador to Seoul, Xinghai Ming, and stressed the importance of Seoul-Beijing ties. Yoon said he was confident of further development of bilateral ties. <laughs> In response, Xing stressed the close economic and diplomatic relationship between the two countries. 
China is South Korea's third largest trading partner now, but it could be the second largest in three years. We are inseparable neighbors. Xing delivered a congratulatory message to Yun from Chinese President Xi Jinping, which said South Korea and China are close neighbors and important cooperation partners. In the message, she highlighted a willingness to deepen their friendly cooperation, marking the three decades of diplomatic ties. President Oleg Yoon also met the U.S. Embassy's charge at affairs ad interim, Christopher Del Corso, and stressed a strong Seoul-Washington alliance, calling it a blood alliance. During the meeting, Yoon expressed thanks for Biden's congratulatory message and phone call on Thursday. He also stressed his willingness to cooperate with Washington on various issues, including the economy, climate, health and technology. Del Corso highlighted that the U.S. Embassy is willing to closely work with the new South Korean government. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. Yoon's campaign promises include a complete reform of the top office. Reportedly, he plans to follow through by carrying out relocation and cutting down the number of Chung Wade staff. Kim hyun sung has the details. The Blue House is in line for a total makeover. President-elect Yoon suk yeol promises to shed the Blue House's extra weight, first by getting rid of the senior secretaries. Yoon said that with the help of senior secretaries, previous presidents had often overridden the decisions of other institutions and impeded investigations. So instead of appointing a senior to overlook government affairs, Yoon will leave each task to those who do it best, not only using the existing public officials, but also bringing in talent from outside. Yoon also plans to close down the office of the First Lady so as to not waste taxpayers' money on private affairs. After these changes, Yoon expects to slim down the Blue House staff by 30 percent. But a leaner workforce is not the only thing on the Blue House agenda. Yoon has also promised to move the new presidential office to here, Gwangamun, the heart of Seoul and the site of many historic protests. Now this move shows how Yoon intends to be right among the public as he leads the country. The current Blue House sits atop a hill, sandwiched between Gyeongbokgung Palace and the Bugaksan Mountain. Yoon has criticized this location for cutting off communication with the public and resembling a palace from the dynasty era. So instead, Yoon is looking to relocate the presidential office to this whole government complex in Gwangamun. But this move is expected to face challenges. Previous administrations had also made the same promise, but did not follow through, citing security and cost problems. Yoon and his party say that they won't repeat that mistake. This whole Blue House reform had been one of Yoon suk top 10 pledges announced in February and seems to be one of the first of many promises Yoon intends to keep when he takes office in May. Kim hyun Arirang News. A key pledge made by Yoon, having a more private sector-led economic growth, the president-elect promised to help small businesses recover from the pandemic and plans to tame runway real estate prices by boosting supply and reforming the tax system. Um Jung sheds light on his economic agenda. In his single five-year term, president-elect Yoon suk will take the steering wheel of Asia's fourth-largest economy. Following Yoon's narrow victory on Thursday, the value of the Korean won increased by the largest amount in more than a year, while South Korea's benchmark Kospi advanced by around 2 percent. This, as Yoon is seen to be more market-friendly than outgoing President Moon Jae-in and has pledged to create private sector-led growth. 
국민 개개인에게 공정한 기회가 보장되고 자율과 창의를 마음껏 발휘할 수 있는 역동적인 나라 정부 주도가 아닌 민간 중심의 경제로 전환하여 일자리를 창출하고 중산층을 더욱 두텁게 할 것입니다. By easing regulations, boosting tax relief, and expanding infrastructure, he says the government will take a back seat and let companies actively create jobs and develop innovative technology. But his government will intervene where help is needed. 코로나로 벼랑 끝에 몰린 자영업자와 소상공인을 위해 고통 분담에 적극 나서고 미래의 준비도 철저히 하겠습니다. One of his most important promises is his plan to spend around 40 billion U.S. dollars as soon as he is inaugurated by drawing a supplementary budget to provide relief to small merchants hit by the pandemic. Also in the spotlight are his pledges to reform the property market to tame the country's runaway house prices. During his five years in office, he promises to supply the market with a total of around 2.5 million homes nationwide, mainly by reconstructing old buildings. At the moment, the pledge can help stabilize consumer sentiment in the real estate market. But a concrete action plan, including choosing the sites and securing financial resources, is needed. Yoon also plans to ease the real estate tax regulations. He promises to lower capital gains and property ownership taxes by combining them in order to increase transactions in the market. However, with this hefty amount of support and no plans to increase taxes, Yoon says physical rules will be implemented within one year of his inauguration to keep rising government debt in check. Om ji Arirang News. The nation's daily COVID-19 daily was at a record high of over 344,000 as of 9 p.m. local time. Meanwhile, the government announced important changes to its COVID-19 strategy. No more mandatory quarantine for people arriving in the country fully vaccinated. Rapid antigen tests will be considered as valid as PCR tests. Chen min -jung brings the updates. The South Korean government on Friday announced a series of revisions to its COVID-19 protocols, including a change in the COVID-19 testing process. From next week, officials will approve rapid antigen test results provided by professionals as being official, even without results from PCR tests. Literally, it will be a rapid test, which will allow us to preemptively prevent further infections. Health officials have said PCR tests that follow rapid antigen tests are positive 90 to 95 percent of the time. The new measures only apply to rapid antigen tests carried out by medical experts at hospitals or clinics and not the self-test kits done by people at home. Authorities say there are more benefits to the simplified testing measure, as currently, people are required to take PCR tests after testing positive through a rapid antigen test, which causes delays in prescribing medicine and treating patients. The government has also decided to allow those already in hospital for other reasons to be treated in regular wards if they show mild COVID-19 symptoms. This way, hospital beds can be used more efficiently for those COVID-19 patients who are in desperate need of medical treatment. And starting on March 21st, fully vaccinated inbound arrivals to South Korea will be exempt from self-quarantine. Currently, quarantine is mandatory upon arrival for everyone regardless of vaccination status. However, those arriving from high-risk countries including Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Ukraine and Myanmar are still subject to isolation. From April 1st, all entrants will also be able to use regular public transportation when leaving the airport. The changes come as South Korea on Friday reported 282,987 new COVID-19 cases. It's a drop from the previous day, but this could be due to fewer tests being done on presidential election day on Wednesday. There are currently more than 1,100 people in critical condition, and there has been another record high of 229 deaths. Prime Minister Kim Bugam on Friday said the Omicron wave will hit its peak within the next few days, with daily cases reaching as high as 370,000. Choi min -jung, Arirang News.
North Korea appears to be repairing the Punggiri nuclear test site dismantled in May 2018. South Korea's defense ministry detected movement by the regime that appears to be restoring part of the site's tunnels. Seoul and Washington are monitoring the situation and are closely cooperating on the matter. Last week, signs of activity at the site were seen in commercial satellite imagery. It showed the construction of a new building and repairs to an existing one. Seoul and Washington disclosed further details about North Korea's recent missile launches. While the regime claims they were part of a program to develop recon satellites, the Allies suspect they could be a test of a new ICBM system. Peonji reports. South Korea and the U.S. announced Friday that North Korea's ballistic missile launches on February 27th and March 5th appeared to be related to its new intercontinental ballistic missile system that was first seen at a military parade in October 2020. Experts say the Hwasong-17 is estimated to be around 24 meters long, slightly longer than the previous model Hwasong-15. Hwasong-17 is the largest liquid-fueled ICBM. The reason why they're trying to make it bigger is probably to create an ICBM that can carry multiple nuclear warheads. Seoul's defense ministry said intelligence agencies from South Korea and the U.S. assessed that the two launches did not demonstrate full ICBM capabilities in terms of range. But it said they were likely intended to test elements of the new system before a maximum range launch is conducted. The defense ministry added that it strongly condemns launches that violate U.N. Security Council resolutions and raise tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Disclosing detailed information such as this is very rare as normally neither South Korea or the U.S. reveal specific details of North Korea's missile launches. U.S. Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby said in a statement that the decision was made because the international community must speak in a united voice to oppose the further development of such weapons by the North. He also noted that U.S. forces in the Pacific have stepped up surveillance activities in the West Sea and ordered enhanced readiness among missile defense forces in the region. A U.S. official, speaking anonymously, said Washington will be imposing a new round of sanctions on Pyongyang. The official said the government will announce new actions on Friday to help prevent North Korea from advancing its weapons programs, and that this will be followed by a range of further actions in the coming days. But despite international criticism and calls to return to talks, the North, while insisting that it's speeding up efforts to develop reconnaissance satellites, appears to be developing long-range missiles. The North state-run news agency said Friday that its leader Kim Jong-un visited the regime's satellite launch site and ordered the expansion of the launching facility that is capable of firing intercontinental ballistic rockets. Kim visited the Sohe satellite launching ground, which has been used to put a satellite in orbit. But the same facility can also be used to conduct various tests involving technology that requires similar to that used in ICBMs. He called for its modernization so that various rockets can be launched to carry multi-purpose satellites. Arirang News. Vice Foreign Ministers of Seoul, Washington and Tokyo held a phone meeting on Friday and agreed to strengthen trilateral cooperation to halt rising tensions on the peninsula due to North Korean provocations. South Korea's Foreign Ministry said Cha jong gun Wendy Sherman and Takeo Mori discussed matters related to the peninsula and the war in Ukraine. The session comes amid widespread speculation that the regime's next ICBM test is imminent, which would indicate Pyongyang will scrap self-imposed moratorium on nuclear and ICBM tests. Turning to the latest on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Russian troops are now heading to the Ukrainian capital, while Ukraine's presidential aide says several cities in the country are under attack. Ari Rayon is standing by on the line with the latest. Rayon, do fill us in. Daniel, Russia's invasion of Ukraine entered its 16th day on Friday, and the devastation of war felt by civilians worsens by the day. Civilians trapped in the southeastern city of Mariupol had gone through two days of hell with Russian troops attacking the city every 30 minutes. Some are trying to rescue others, including young children who are trapped, while many have lost their homes, like this man who is now looking for shelter. I don't have a home anymore. That's why I'm moving. Why else would I be walking about? It doesn't exist anymore. It was hit by a motor. 
The International Red Cross says hundreds and thousands of people in the region are facing an increasingly desperate humanitarian situation. According to Ukrainian authorities, three more cities in Ukraine have been targeted by Russian airstrikes on Friday in a move that suggests Moscow is expanding its attack further into the city. Major cities in Ukraine, such as Dnipro and Lutsk, have been under attack from Russian forces for the first time. The third city to be under siege is Chernihiv in the north of the city the north of the country. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said about 100,000 people have been evacuated using humanitarian corridors since Thursday. The UN Human Rights Office has reported that at least 549 Ukrainian civilians have been killed and another 957 wounded since Russia invaded just over two weeks ago, but added that the actual figures could be considerably higher. A Ukrainian parliamentary official on Thursday said at least 71 children Children have been killed and that more than 2.2 million people have fled Ukraine since the invasion. Meanwhile, on Friday, the Biden administration said that Russia's attempt to seize assets from American companies would end in more economic pain for Russia. Prior to this, there have been reports that the Russian government may be planning on seizing the assets of companies that, le have, that have left the country, including those from Europe, Japan and the U.S. As of Friday local time, President Joe Biden will announce that the U.S., G7 countries and European Union will call for revoking Russia's most favored nation status. Revoking the preferential trading status would mean that the U.S. and its allies would be able to impose tariffs on Russia, which would further isolate its, its, its economy. That's all I have for this hour. Back to you, Daniel. All right, thank you for those updates, Rayhan. We appreciate it. Moving on to other stories now, the city of Seoul announced a new project aimed at upgrading 1 million buildings to make them low carbon. The goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by making energy-saving improvements over the next several years to buildings both public and private. These will include new insulation, eco-friendly boilers, LED lightings, and more. The program will run through 2026, starting this year with 150,000 buildings. For privately owned homes and offices, the city will encourage people to make improvements by providing subsidies. The prolonged dryness will be alleviated this weekend with the help of nationwide showers. Rain will begin tomorrow night starting from the Seoul metropolitan area in Gangwon-do province. Showers will spread across the entire nation by Sunday morning. The amount of rain won't be too much with about 5 to 30 millimeters nationwide. Finest particles have eased off compared to yesterday apart from western central regions. Dust concentrations will stay high across the Seoul metropolitan area and Chungcheong the province. Please have a mask that can filter out the dust particles. The rest of the nation will see air quality in normal levels. Expect partly cloudy to overcast skies for the morning. Seoul will start up at 6 degrees Celsius. Daytime highs will be 1 to 5 degrees warmer than today. Seoul will get up to 19 degrees. Daejeon and Gyeongju 20. Daegu will make it to 21 degrees. Mild conditions will continue for the time being with temperatures hovering around the seasonal norms. It's all for now and here are the weather conditions around the world. These are the stories we're following at this hour. From all of us here at Arirang News, thank you for watching.